Hello, everyone. This is Chris Sawyer, the sommelier to the stars. That's you guys. Um, I am having a great time here. I've been uh, with Dominic uh, Chapelet, and we've been discussing what we're going to teach you today. Uh, Dominic, uh, so great to be here with you, and uh, thank you once again for this great invite. Oh, thanks, Chris. Uh, it's it's fun to get to catch up a little bit, and uh, so I'm sure this will be a good time. So, I'm absolutely. Ready. Oh. Well, I think that uh, to start off with, this is a great theme show and it is wine and food pairings. Um, my background obviously goes uh, way back 30 plus years of being a sommelier and a national wine writer. I've had a lot of great food and wine pairings put in front of me and I've done a lot myself. You know, I worked for the Getty family, John Lasseter, you know, all sorts of people that have always had great stars and people that, um, you know, really are very well known, but the fact is I know more about wine than they do. And that's my job is to help them have great experiences. Um, and I've been lucky enough to really follow Chapelet since the beginning. I mean, this is uh, one of the great, great houses of wine of Napa Valley. And, uh, you know, I was there a few years ago and we'll talk about the 50 year anniversary in a few minutes. But I think that the most important thing about today's show is to kind of think about how Chapelet has evolved and how parallel it is with how the food culture has evolved. I think that's really a special thing. Think back to 1967. Where were you guys all at in 1967? I bet you if some of you weren't even born and that includes me and I don't know about you. Dominic, I don't think you were born in 1967. Uh, I wasn't even being thought of. I, I, <laughs> I think I surprised them when I came along. So yeah, that was soon after that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think that just, uh, this is a conceptually a very interesting thing to follow this trend and how it went. When I was a kid, I grew up in Russian River Valley and my mom would go tasting in Napa Valley. When I would go to Napa Valley, there were a lot of fruit trees there. There were a lot of um, animals there, like cattle and, and pigs and everything. It was very, very diverse agriculture there. There were pear trees, plum trees, um, prunes, there were uh, walnut trees everywhere. So how it's, how it's changed has been very interesting. But the food culture really kind of started in the late 70s there when things started to change a little bit. Think about the 70s and what people were eating. Steak and potatoes was commonplace. People didn't know anything about sushi. Uh, Indian food was very, very rare. Like you had to go to uh, New York to eat Indian food of any sorts. You didn't know much about all these types of vegetables. What is a purple potato? I have no idea. You know, these things have all happened during our lifetime. And that's why I, uh, we were just, Dominic and I were just saying like, as kids, I knew nothing about sushi. My 11 year old kid, he wants sushi all the time. So these are trends that have happened over this 50 year plus period that, you know, Chapelet brand has been in existence. So we look at Napa Valley and we think about Etoile, uh, which was an amazing restaurant that came into Yauntville to really kind of start this thing blossoming. Then you had you know, Auberge, and then you had um, the amazing French Laundry came in, and things happened. And Yauntville used to be a, just a, where you got gas, and now look at the place. It's amazing. The same thing with St. Helena, same thing with Calistoga, Napa, everywhere. And I would say that's the same thing here. When I started as a sommelier in Sonoma County, there were two restaurants of note. John Ash, amazing chef that I got to work with a little bit. And also uh, Michael um, Hirschberg, who always had a great restaurant, no matter what style it was, he always had the great things. And that's where I started as a sommelier is with Michael Hirschberg. Um, I think that these trends are really important to all of us because we food has become such a part of our lives now that it wasn't really this big in the old days and i think that wine has done the same thing and they really run a parallel line and i think that's why this the today's show is going to be so fun to get on there so i want to talk about just to start with before we really kind of get into the history of chapelet and how this all relates to to the real um rules of, of pairing wines and food together it starts with a it. big decision very, very big decision. Is the your pairing based on the food or is it based on the wine? 
because actually you have to go with one or the other. There, you can't do both together. It has to be a focus there. And this was a great uh, thing that um, Evan Goldstein, my great mentor, Evan um, Goldstein, the master sommelier, and I talked about. There's a story in the new Napa Life magazine that um, I wrote, and it's right here. And you might notice the Chapelet um, Chenin Blanc bottle sitting right there. Oh, go figure. And there's the picture of Evan. There's me and Evan together, like right there. Um, you know, this is something that you really, that Evan even talks about, is you really have to pick what is your target. You know, you can, if it's based on a really great wine that you really want to show off, you really need to mold that food around it. But if it's based on food, which is mainly the choice, I mean, come on. And what are we eating at the table? I mean, there could be four dishes at the table if we go to a restaurant or at home, it's one dish that everyone's having, but that wine is going to complement that dish. So the role of a sommelier, think about this, you guys, when you go to a restaurant, my job as the sommelier you don't walk in the doors because of me. You walk in because the food is great. That's really what it comes down to. So my job is to compliment that, make the chef look great, make the food um, shine, make you want to hug me on the way out because that's the way it should roll, right? So um, having the right tools is really important. And I think that you have to start thinking about it with based on the food, if that's really your focus here, you really need to look at something, some points here that are really important that we're gonna talk about as we move along. We taste these wonderful wines um, from, the, from the different places that um, we're, we're gonna focus on today, which is the estate, and then also some uh, new projects with Grower Collection, uh, which are really great from over here in Sonoma County. So I think that the focus um, when you start with food is what are the ingredients? You know, Is it really about freshness that we're trying to showcase? Is it just something raw. Is it just an oyster? I mean, an oyster and a bottle of the Chenin Blanc, I, you got me. I'm sold. I, you shot, sign me up. I'm there. You know, or is it some wild mushrooms that you, someone just happened to forage off in the, in the forest and bring to you and you, you're like, oh, wow, I got to eat these, you know? Is it something that's cooked? Um, is it baked? Is it grilled? Grilled is a very big thing. We'll talk about grilled in a few minutes too, because I think that grill is a very key factor because especially with bigger wines, you can do things like um, salmon or, or fish. If you grill it, it gives it more density and it gives flavors that were not there if it was just a raw or just a um, pan seared style. So speaking of pan seared, I mean, are you using olive oil, a specialty olive oil? Are you using butter? Or what kind of salt are you using? So all these ingredients do make a factor here. In the case of the, the uh, wines themselves, you have some very, very important things you have to think about. What is the acid level? And as we go through this, this is what uh, Dominic and I are gonna talk a little bit about the acid levels. The acid level, how much alcohol is in there? What are the tannins? What is the sweetness? And also, what is the oak program? You know, is the oak showy? Is it kind of like something that maybe it's too much right now and you're going to need to decant that wine or maybe it's going to get better in the glass and you start with something a little rougher and then it'll smooth out as you go along. So these are all factors that come into play and the reason I'm so honored to be here today and, and to be with Dominic I think is because we right now everyone uh, we're, we're appreciating everything we've got. I mean this has been a crazy year we all know this um, but, you know, I've had such great times sharing wines with great friends and eating good food. I mean, come on, I, you know, we can't go to all the restaurants we want. Um, and we're starting to cook more at home. And I think if you guys learned some lessons from us today, I hope you'll apply them at home with, of course, with some Chapelet wines. Um, but, oh. you know, also just thinking outside the box. And I think that's what all of us need to really think about is this progression of food culture has gone so far that we are thinking on different levels than we we did when we were kids we are here at a different time period we are taking advantage of what time we have to share these kinds of things with friends but don't be afraid to try crazy things that's the other lesson i want to teach you and also that you know you can never learn enough. It's the same thing with wine. If, if Dominic and I said that we know everything about wine, we're completely foolish and we're pulling your leg. It's impossible. Every vintage changes things, factors that mother nature throws at us as, as recently uh, as we very well know um, has happened. 
but this is really something that I think you guys can use these tools and that's why this is a fun factor show. I hope you guys will enjoy this. So yes, without further he, ado, I want to uh, raised his hand. And so, okay, since there's a hand raised, I'm going okay. to uh, see what that means. It says allow to talk. Um, this is, it's hard to do on this. I can promote you for a moment to panelist. Okay, Eugene, you're on. Oh, you're, you're muted. Oh, Eugene wanted to come on, but. Oh, the, I just saw him. I see him there, but he's muted. So I was okay. trying to give him a shot. Yeah. All right, well, ask to unmute. All right, well, we'll move on. Sorry about that. Okay, Chris. that's all right, no problem. So, I mean, I think that why this show today is so fun too is because the real key to food and wine pairings is balance. And when I think about um, balance, I think about Chapelet wines. I think about a sense of place. I think about um, feeling, not that I'm just, doing something with Napa Valley and in some cases as we're going to talk about with Sonoma County. Um, but I also want to feel like I'm there. Even if I'm at home, I want to feel like I'm in wine country. And I think that's the purity of this fruit flavors that they're able to capture. It's really this sense of sight. So um, if you guys don't know where Chapelet is, I, I'm sure that some of you have visited Chapelet like me many, many times. It is one of the most um, prolific sites of Napa Valley. It is actually not its own appellation, it's what I would call a monopole. Um, a monopole is a single kind of area where it's very well known for wine and we'll go into the history of this in just a moment. But the fact is it's pretty much overlooking Oakville uh, right there. It's up on the hill of the Vaca Mountains and I think uh, Dominic is, is uh, dialing in. And I wanna say one thing too, you know, Cyril and I were gonna do this show together, but I feel like it's even better that Dominic and I are doing it as well, because we're, we're a little bit more in the same age group. But the other thing is that, you know, Dominic has been really key um, for the family to, uh, you know, protect uh, Pritchard Hill, which we're gonna be talking about from the fires that have been happening up there, especially the Lake Hennessy fire. And Lake Hennessy is right there in that uh, base, uh, right near where you can see the entrance to Pritchard Hill. That's Lake Hennessy right there. Um, and this is the layout of the of the actual property. You've got some amazing neighbors up there, you know, uh, with Tim Mondavi and Continuum and so many other great producers that are in this little area called uh, Pritchard Hill. But it has a very unique rock structure. It has everything about it, it has its own unique identity. So. Without further um, you know, ado, I'd like to just turn it over to Dominic for a few minutes to tell, to tell everyone a little bit about the family heritage there. And what the heck were your mom and dad thinking for planting grapes up there when, when Cabernet wasn't even really in vogue? Yeah. Well, first of all, Chris, let me just say that uh, you said before we started when we were talking that you were gonna make people hungry and thirsty and <laughs> you have done your job and uh, now I'm just frustrated. Yeah. I wanna try everything that you were talking <laughs> about. And, um, but we'll we'll move on from that. Um, so, how it started up here for us was uh, my mother and father. Uh, my father had a a passion for wine as a young man, and he was collecting wine in his cellar. Uh, he had a business that he went right into uh, that he and his best friend and uh, business partner went into right after college, and uh, they worked really hard and, and managed to sort of hit the ground running with uh, just sort of a crazy concept of taking a vending machine and uh, making it brew coffee cup by cup. Wow. And, uh, and so, you know, for whatever reason, they, they wanted to be entrepreneurs and, uh, and hit something that, uh, that resonated with people. Um, but, you know, the business grew, it did very well for them. And uh, eventually they, they went public but when that happened, uh, it became less entrepreneurial and more managing the stockholders and, sure. and not so much fun. But the thing that was really always exciting for my dad was on the weekend, getting together with some friends, uh, getting a call from a wine shop saying, hey, we've, we've got something really special in here. You might want to come down and, and see if there's a couple bottles you'd like to get. And he started collecting a seller that uh, 
we still have bits and pieces of today, but they inspired him to the point where my mom, when she saw him coming home from a day at work, you know, and, and not being inspired and saying, well, you know, Don, you know, is everything good? Yeah, everything's fine. Just another day at work. Um, she, she really prompted him to, to look and say, you know, what, what do you love? Well, you, you've, you've done, you're a young man and you've done really well. You know, he said, well, I, you know, I love collecting these wines and drinking these wines, but I, I don't know what that means. You know, what would I do? Would I make wine? And, um, and somehow that, that idea stuck. And, you know, five kids and, and a beautiful house down in Los Angeles. And uh, they decided, you know, gosh, maybe, maybe I could try making wine, but do we have to go to France to, to go and, and yeah. chase after this dream of making world-class wines? Uh, because that's all I'd want to do. If I were to make wine, I'd want to be the, you know, I'd really want to be thought of as one of the best. And yeah. um, because those are the wines that excite me. So he was collecting, you know, Latour and Mouton and Margot and, you know, the big wine houses that we all know as these icons. Sure. Um, uh, those were the inspiring ones to him. He had had a few wines coming out of, uh, out of California, most notably some of the early wines that Andre Chelichev was making at BV. Right. Uh, right. and, and those two, you know, showed him there was, there was promise in California. Maybe mm -hmm. you could go and, and be, sit on the world stage with these other wines. Right. Um, so after, you know, talks with my mom and, and deciding that maybe this dream could become a reality, they literally sold everything and said, well, I guess we're going to do it. We're all in. Uh, and yep. they moved up to Napa Valley. They did some research and had some talks with Andre Chelichev, who said, you know, after some tasting with my dad that, well, I, I see the type of wine that you like. And, uh, and I can tell you, I think I make some pretty, pretty good wines from the valley floor here. Yeah. But I'd probably make wines more to your liking and maybe even better if I could get more grapes from the hills. Yeah. And that was all my dad need, needed to hear. Yeah. So uh, he started looking at hillside properties. Yeah. Prickly Hill here uh, is the first property that they looked at and ultimately the one that, uh, that stuck with them uh, and we're so, so grateful to, you know, call our home now. And it turned out to be quite fortuitous because this area has gone on to, to become a world-class wine region, uh, something that, you know, people look towards, uh, I think it's recognized as uh, you know, when people hear that Pritchard Hill moniker, um, yep. you know, they think about high quality and that's what yep. my dad, you know, was really after right from the beginning. So, that's awesome. you know, just, just an amazing, um, amazing series of events, uh, some real, some real grit and, uh, and, and daring, I think, to take, you know, your five kids and your beautiful house and say, well, you know what, let's start all over. Uh, I can't imagine doing that at 34 years old. If I had, you know, sort of made my own way and done it, uh, that, that would have been uh, a lot to undertake. So I'm very grateful that uh, we ended up here and he, he got us here. So that's the yeah. beginning. That's where it started. That's amazing. You know, the, the Hillside Vineyard there is such an interesting thing. And that's really cool that you brought up Andre Chelichev. I want to say one thing for BV this year. This is their 120 year anniversary, everyone. 120 years old. I mean, and the fact is when Andre came here, he really was talking about the Rutherford bench originally. That's what he was introduced to. He got here in 1939 or 1938. But when they made their first wine, it was from Graves picked in 1936. And I've tasted that wine before. And uh, it's an amazing uh, wine, but it, it was the first real nouveau modern, pre-modern kind of Cabernet. And it was really down there in the Rutherford bench and what we call, thanks to his great saying, the Rutherford dust. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great, great uh, term that he invented. But when you start thinking about it, mountain fruit was really kind of rare at the time. And if it was mountain fruit, it probably wasn't cab. Now a change to that started um, back in, in Diamond Mountain uh, area, which is Diamond Creek. And Diamond Creek, uh, when the great uh, Bernsteins um, founded that winery back in the late 60s, right around the time when your mom uh, and dad, Molly and, and Don, bought this piece of property, 
they were developing that on the other side and closer to Calistoga, so really in the Mayacamas Mountains. But an interesting tidbit for everyone out there, and if you guys win a trivia contest and a lot of money, don't forget who told you this. Um, Diamond Creek was the first ever to price their wine uh, Cabernet at a hundred dollars a uh, bottle. So whoa! So I now you know. There you there you know. Uh, so you now you know it's 120 years for uh, BV and and uh, where Diamond Creek uh, why they're so uh, trivial knowledge um, centric. You know, um, but the fact is where you were at was unclaimed. Uh, people didn't know what to do. They were afraid to um, grow up there. But if you look at the picture behind Dominic, I think you can see that there are swales. There are things about this property there that they're not level. Believe me, there's nothing super flat up there. But the swales and the, the sun exposure there is so inter, intricate to everything that's happening there. So I think that it's really the development of that vineyard and how it's matured uh, through the years. As you can see here is a new map that he's laying out, uh, the Mayakamas Mountains. And then- It's telling me that I'm going to one place, but it's sending me to another. Okay. It's, it's technology, but, you have to work with us a little bit, so. Yeah, absolutely. So, that's why I thought today um, we would start off by talking a little bit bigger. Um, first of all, you say Napa Valley, what's the first thing that comes to most people's minds? Cabernet, Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon. Really, um, Don and Molly were leaders of this charge there right after you know, Robert Mondavi, 1966, and all these kinds of um, bigger ones down the valley floor were really starting to blossom is when this winery really came about. And I think that this is an important factor that Cabernet became kind of your signature wine. And so that's why we decided to really talk about Cabernet first. We're gonna go into some amazing other selections uh, from Sonoma Coast and, and why they make more sense now than ever before because of our food culture. But I mean, this is the trademark of the winery right here. So this is the Chapelet um, 2017 vintage Cabernet. This is the signature. Um, 50 years on Pritchard Hill, it says right there. That is true. 1967 to 19, uh, or to 2017. I was very, very honored to be there at the tasting, the, the retrospective tasting that we did in 2017. And we'll talk about that on the next show. And we'll tell you more details about the next show and what we're going to talk about building a, a cellar. I think that's more of a topic on in that show than this one. But the fact is, this is 50 plus years of tradition here inside this bottle. And I think that that's why when you have uh, courses in your in your um, dinner or even a lunch that's a very, you know, a little bit more detailed lunch and you're sharing this wine with people and you can tell a story about where this wine came from and the, the real heritage of you know, and the, and the bravery of this family that really tried to to make it work. And obviously they did. Um, and this is 50 plus years of this family doing it. So that's why I thought we'd do a, a first cheers to you guys um, all out there, our great um, fans of, of Chapelet and, and people that know me and SawyerSum.com and, and my new varietal show, which is great. I found some too. So I'm, I mean, a cheers with you. Here you go. Cha-ching to all you guys. Cheers. So. Here we are, we start talking about food and wine again. Once again, I will make you guys uh, hungry. That's just my job, I'm sorry. Um, but I think that uh, when, we, when we look at this wine or we taste this wine, first of all, beautiful color, obviously. Get it in the nose, very pretty um, uh, nose too. The berries are all there, but they also get a little bit of the blueberry kind of component to it as well. But the, I think probably the most important thing about this is I get a sense of earth in here and I get a little bit of that wild sage in here and I get little spicy notes um, just on the nose as well. So that is really where I'm kind of starting to think about what do we pair this with? How can we do this that will make it really work with our food? Obviously people really are tending to go towards bolder kinds of foods now. You guys aren't wimps out there, I know it. Um, and there's a lot of people that just will go for the gusto right now and go big, big, big. But I think that this one and what makes it something that's very user friendly for me and a lot of other small yeats out there, is there is a there's a refinement to this wine and there's an elegance to this wine. It has plenty of time to grow up here on this mountain um, that we're looking at right behind Dominic. And I think that that's a really important thing about it because it doesn't need to be rushed and each block is its own block. So you don't pick everything at once, you just kind of do it. So 
Um, beautiful, beautiful nose though. So. So this is uh, this is that picture I kept trying to get up there to give you a sense of uh, of the majority of what we look out upon. This is a, a shot from my my mother's garden, and you know there's different row directions. Uh, as you can see, there's sort of undulations, and it never shows it as well in a picture as it does when you're walking the the grounds. But there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of variation in um, in sun exposure uh, in in elevation, again, in row direction, uh, certainly in soil type. Uh, it gives us this amazing opportunity to have many different blocks uh, throughout the property to, to pick and choose from and to, to blend, um, you know, starting with blending within Cabernet blocks uh, and then working toward, you know, what's gonna work well for that year. Uh, right. So, you know, a really, really remarkable spot to, to be able to make Cabernet up here on Pitcher Hill. I agree. It's just a fantastic um, spot. And like I said, the exposure is very different. There's different plantings, different maturity of vines. There are subsoils there. There is um, different clones of Cabernet. Um, you know, if everything was, um, if it was on all just, um, you know, monolithic and, and just one single clone, that would be one thing, but that's not how it works anymore. And I think that really the 1990s was the game changer for a lot of wineries down the valley floor, especially, but even for you, just the maturity of these vines, that is really the kind of the trademark of France and, and the Bordeaux region in general. It's just, it's maturity of vines. You can taste that soil. And this is something that I think you guys have really picked this place and your mom and dad um, really did such a great idea. You had a great idea in coming here. And I, I think we got to say this too, if you guys, know the hideaway um, uh, label too, which is really the estate wine. We'll probably be talking about this one next time in our next show, which is coming up later um, next month. But I think that um, when you really look at, at the where on, on this property that comes from, it's a really separate than the other one, which is a great blending one that really works with a wider range of food. This one is a little bit more concentrated. You're talking about a little bit more natural richness and density to that wine, just as a, as a, a point of nature there. So I think that this wine really, just first few sips, I mean, and this is always one thing too, if I teach you guys another lesson today, always sip the wine first and then then just kind of have it uh, fill up your palate and then go back and sip it a second time and then get real about it. What does it really taste? You have to regenerate your palate. I mean, especially if you go tasting all, all day long, each wine is so different. There's different levels of acid, sweetness, everything. So you really want to just cleanse your palate with the first sip. So never take the first sip as being like, oh, that's all that it is because that just gives you a clue. And really the second sip, third sip, fourth sip, and especially for wines like this, and this is what I wanna say, is something that is a trademark of a wine that is really a world-class wine. A world-class wine is a wine that only gets better in the glass. It, it's not done. You, it is not a one-dimensional wine that you're gonna taste that the whole way through. Believe me, back in the younger years, when you used to buy those 1.5 liter bottles for the girls and then you taste one, it would taste the same when you first opened it to the very last one, it would taste the same if it wasn't turning into vinegar. These wines are only gonna get better with time in the glass. And that's why this is your little baby decanter is your glass. Yeah. And so I think that that's a really good way. So sometimes those, the, the tannins can be a little bit bigger and forceful at first, but you know, I think that this is more of an elegant style, but they will work themselves out just by having a little bit more air. So Chris, I like what you're saying that, that your, your wine becomes your decanter, because I think, um, you know, certainly I have, and I will continue to decant wines over the years. Um, but I also love to watch a wine of, of grace and elegance uh, progress in the glass. I like it when it's tight and, and, and it isn't giving up its secrets. And, and then over time, things start to happen. And like you said, you know, a, uh, a great wine is evolving throughout the evening, throughout the, you know, the night. And you know, some of the most ex uh, wonderful experiences I've had with wine have been going back to that wine you know, into the third course and saying, oh my God, what's going on now? Yeah. Uh, so, so that's that's sort of a fun journey to take, uh, you know, anytime you've got something that's special in the glass. Absolutely. 
I think just um, these first impressions here for me, um, obviously, you know, if we, we talk about steak, I mean, of course, I mean, do you want to show your picture real quick? I, I because do, I do. I'm going to he, He's just, we talked about this before. You guys got to see what he had to eat last night. Dominic was, he was, he's being a little showy here, but that's okay because we all need one of these uh, every now and then. So. Oh yeah. So, well, my, my brother just uh, came back from Idaho and, uh, and on his way, he decided to, pick something up for me for dinner. And he showed up and he handed oh. me this giant tomahawk. And um, I have to tell you, it was one of the, really one of the best pieces of meat I've ever had. Uh, it was just spectacular. And, and I did have uh, some Cabernet with it. One of our actually, actually had a, a new release uh, that, uh, that we're about to release in September, uh, our 2018 cab, which I hadn't had a glass of. So I thought, well, you know, gosh, if there's anything that's gonna stand up to, you know, a young cab, let's, let's try this big, fatty, amazing piece of meat. And it <laughs> yeah. was incredible. So, um, you know, you, you get a tomahawk and, and you gotta cook it, you gotta go. Absolutely. You know, I think that's a, that's a good point there too. So fattiness is, is a really good um, tool to use too, because tannins need fattiness. Um, they need to be a little bit tamed by that. And young wines ha tend to be a little bit more tannic. Um, they're supposed, that's why we sell our wines is to really smooth them out, let the pieces come together a little bit more. But to be really honest, I mean, people, you know, 95 plus percent of people consume the wine that they buy just right then. So I think that really the, the key here, and I think I hope, hope that you guys heard that, is really to kind of get, I think stemware is really important and, and to really have good glassware to let this wine open up and that those tannins to settle down a little bit. And if you need some fat, get a piece, piece of meat like that, obviously. I mean, that's awesome. You know, I, I, wanted, I wanted to reach and right, right through the, like, my lens and grab that right there from you. But um, I think it really, tomorrow, so it's... yeah. <laughs> One of the things too, just about this, these berry flavors in here, these are a little bit more wild berry. So think about blackberry, a little bit of a briary kind of berry. There's almost like a boysenberry kind of note too. And definitely some of that black raspberry in there. So you're talking about a lot of hillside, almost like uh, down in our creek here, um, you know, we go down there and pick these blackberries that are crazy, but they're growing out of trees. So they're like in these little clusters hanging from trees because it's so dense down there that they really have a certain flavor. So they're big and juicy, but they're not necessarily that sweet. And I think that's really this level of sweetness is it tastes like the berries, but they're not sweet berries. For, uh, you know, like where there's residual sugar in here. So I think that's a very important thing. The tannins are balanced. It's got great acidity. They still have as freshness. And I think that's one of the trademarks of the Chapelet brand and, and Philip, um, you know, the great uh, Philip Titan who makes these wines and has for a long time. He's got, his winemaker touch is a minimalist touch. And I think that's really something that you, it's a, something that your dad and your mom really wanted to do. And I think your family has done a great job at doing that. Well, I mean, that, that goes right back to um, having the right piece of property, you know, and doing, doing it in the vineyard and letting the vineyard do its work and letting the vineyard speak through the wine. And, and if you're doing your job and if you've got a great vineyard manager and, you're, and you've got the right grapes in the right place, and then you've got a winemaker who can allow that to express itself, that's, that's where that magic comes from. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I have to say, you, you mentioned the, the grapes and the, um, and the berries. Um, and if you don't mind, Chris, I, I'll go into just a little story about my Please mom. Do. In that early, uh, one of our early vintages, and I actually think it was 1968, uh, our winery wasn't finished, but we had a crop to bring in. And um, we had some very kind neighbors down the valley who said, well, we can help you out. Why don't you just bring your grapes down here and we'll crush them for you. Uh, and that was Robert Mondavi, who had just built his new winery in 1966. Yep. My mom and dad went down there and, you know, the, the grapes were all in the, in the small little wooden picking bins. And, uh, and my mom was looking at, at Robert's big, beautiful grapes and, and our little tiny grapes next to them. And she said, oh, I'm so embarrassed. You know, they've got these tiny little berries and, and I just, and look at your big, beautiful grapes. And, and Robert Mondavi said to my mom, oh, Molly, I, I wish I had the grapes that are in your bin. <laughs> yeah. And the I reason that's, being, yeah, go ahead. It, it's again, speaks to that mountain fruit. These, great, these yeah. vines are struggling a bit. Um, the, the berries are smaller. 
that you, know, you can talk about this, Chris, that skin to juice ratio and what that means, but there's an intensity that, uh, that's brought about by these. So I'll, yeah. I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, so the difference, think about what I said earlier too about me going to Napa Valley in the 70s and, and looking at all this stuff. There was deep yeah. soils there in certain parts of the valley, especially near the riverbed there. there I mean, you can grow Sauvignon Blanc and those roots can be a hundred feet deep. Mm -hmm. Here up on this mountain, this is rock. I mean, this is this is um, this is stuff that you just don't like. You don't want to be the gardener in that often. Mm -hmm. You want to get it to be right, and then please let it go. Just just please grow. But you know the struggle that these grapes go through. It comes out in the flavor and the intensity there. And it is a better thing too to be those compact kinds of of clusters. And I think we've found so many of those great lessons, not just from where you're at there in Pritchard Hill, but also Atlas Peak and Howell Mountain and, you know, across the valley on the other part of the Mayacamas. Their mountain fruit from Napa Valley, mountain calves are completely different than valley calves. They just have a different kind of aura to them. I think that's a great point about Robert Mondavi being a little envious of the size of those clusters. And I think that's a great lesson that Molly learned that day. And I hope she understood it later, even though she felt, you know, she, she like it wasn't the right thing, but it was the right thing. And I agree. Well, that was a, that was a, a great and long lived friendship between, uh, between my parents and, uh, and the Mandavis. Um, and uh, it started right in the beginning, you know, where there was a pretty amazing community up here. I think they were very curious about this you know, young couple with five kids who, who moved up to Napa Valley and, uh, and we're going to start a winery. And, you know, nobody was doing that. That, that, was, not, uh, that was not common at all at that time. So um, I think right. there was a lot of curiosity and they were sort of, you know. That's great. On? I want to uh, say uh, just hello to everyone out there too. We'll get to your uh, uh, questions and answers at, towards the end. Um, and uh, I just also want to say, hey, it's great to see people from Virginia and, and Maryland and uh, uh, Pennsylvania and everyone tuning into us right now. You know, here we are in California and, and obviously we have got, oh, there's a Texas, you know, Matthew from Texas. Uh, welcome. You know, this is a... Uh, Napa Valley is a great place to go. I mean, and we're going to talk about Sonoma County and why it's so great too in a minute. But, you know, we're lucky to live here. Um, and I think that really as next generation kids like Dominic and I are, and, and there's the third generation for you, Dominic, too, that's really coming out. Um, you know, this is preserving these areas. And I think that really Pritchard Hill is one of those great places in not only the United States, but I think the world um, where people respect this place. And I think that it really kind of took your parents to really become brave uh, people, even though they weren't previously winemakers or anything like that. Um, I think that's a really good point. So cheers to them once again, but what would they be eating with this? So once again, we talked about um, steak, which I think would be great. Um, but you know, there's things with Cabernet, especially if it's done in this elegant style. And I'll say one thing that would be really nice with this that most people would go like, are you serious? Ahi tuna, mm -hmm. but listen to this. Doing a kind of an espresso rub on the outside of the tuna and then just pan searing the whole um, kind of tenderloin of it. Um, and doing that. Uh, Chef and uh, Chef Janine Falvo and I used to do that at the Lodge at Sonoma when I was the sommelier there for 10 years. It was one of the best dishes I ever had in pairing great Cabernets. And sometimes the calves are just too big. I mean, to be really honest, um, they really are. And this one, it has that refined nature to it. And it can, it's not dainty by any means, don't get me wrong. But, you know, when you taste a really good seared one of ahi tuna that middle is very different from the outside and then you put the espresso or wrap around it and you got something going here now don't you the other thing too that i found that's really very interesting with this is if you do paella but you do a squid ink paella um, it's very different and you know just down the road from you um you know is a couple years ago that the winston hill um with um, the frank family Mm -hmm. did a great um, thing for their celebration of their 20th anniversary for their their vintage and they did a paella they had a regular paella over here and then they had this inky one over here and that mm -hmm. with cabernet was genius wow. so thinking outside the box here you guys like seafood and cabernet no way yes if it's done right and i think that's a really key thing i think also a big fat pork chop would go really good with this but in this case probably with a little soy sauce um, as far as the marinade 
and also grilling it so it has char marks on it. So you really have some depth, you have a little bit more stuff going on. You could do a roasted one too, if, as we're getting into the fall and winter years. If one that I would probably do with that would be um, kind of pour, probably more with a sage kind of a integration there with sage, wild sage, because I really feel like that's something when I when I go up to Chapelet, I, I smell the smell of Chapelet, and this the smell up there is that wild sage. It is that the the Chapelet kind of trademark of the um, chaparral bushes around you and these trees and the oak and, and natural oak. So I think that those things are really good examples and kind of outside the box. Remember our, our home ec teachers taught us the basics. Uh, where we've gone since we were kids have, has gone a long ways. And I don't think that those home ec teachers drank the kinds of wines that we drink at all. <laughs> no, but uh... In, in Napa Valley, the, the teachers get a lot of wine gifts at the end of the year, you know. Yes, they do. They're very lucky. And the same thing here in Sonoma County. Don't, don't think that it's not like that. <laughs> um, so I think that's just a great trademark. Once again, this was the um, Chapelet. This is the signature Cabernet. Um, amazing. This is, once again, the 50-year anniversary vintage of it because it's 1967 to um, 2017. It's tasting beautiful right now. It is something that I, I, I'm just going to be enjoying the rest of that wine later tonight. But <laughs> moving on, once again, talking about food trends and wine trends kind of going together. So back until really the late 70s, early 80s, Chardonnay was nothing. I mean, to be really honest, you guys. And I do want to say a word, another word about the Chenin Blanc, which was featured in my story here. Um, the Chenin Blanc from Chapelet. Let me give you guys a statistic that will be very, very interesting to everyone out there. And it was when I talked with the Wente family, I did a, um, a story on with uh, Phil, Carolyn and uh, Greg and or Eric sorry and we did a I did a story and they told me one of the most interesting statistics I've ever heard in the wine industry. In 1980 there were 50,000 acres of Chenin Blanc planted in California. There were less than 10,000 acres of Chardonnay. In five year period that completely switched completely. Even if they were grafting over or pulling the Chenin Blanc out, it's because the Chenin Blanc back then was a sweeter style overall, not for everyone and especially not for the Chapelet um, brand, but that's what people liked is a little bit more sweetness. Riesling was big, Gewürztraminer was big. All these kinds of more sweeter things were bigger. Now, the beginning part of the Chardonnay phenomenon, you go back to Hansel and Wente as far as the, the legends and, you know, the San Giacomo family, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes here um, as well. And what we've done with Chardonnay has gone through a completely different change. I mean, we, we had at one point, there was that term ABC, anything but Chardonnay, you know, <laughs> because things were too sweet and they were too trendy and things were not happening. I feel like the Chardonnays have never been so good. Um, and one of the reasons for that is Sonoma County. Um, it just happens to be an area where you can really grow this grape. And I think that that is a real tribute to you and your family. You've got an amazing property up there. The Chenin Blanc is the bomb bomb and it's so good. And I can do all those kinds of things. Um, you know, I was thinking about another one that I would do with that Chenin Blanc too. And that's like, a crudo with um, just yellow um, fin tuna and, and just crudo um, and just something like that. I love, I love like, I think about um, right now with the hot weather and a split pea soup, but make it chilled. Oh yeah, oh, I'm talking chilled uh, split pea soup and how good that would be with that Shannon. We get a Chardonnay, we have all sorts of wide ranges. So for your program, and that's this new program that you guys really started over the past few years. And I want to kind of uh, have you tell us a little bit about what, what the heck were you guys thinking? Um, but this is the label here and this is from the Petaluma Gap and we'll talk about that in just a moment, but we are really pushing this grape out to the ocean and it can take it. Um, if you go to Burgundy and this is where the heritage goes back to the 17th century of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and I will give you one little tidbit here, another trivial thing, where did Chardonnay come from? 
Is it an indigenous grape? Did it pop out of the ground? No, it's actually from the family of Pinot Noir. So it is even part of the white mutation of Pinot Noir. So Pinot Noir is actually the super duper genius or genus um, of really what is happening here in Sonoma County. But Chardonnay really works. I think we explored a lot of it in, in Carneros over in Napa Valley. We have, and it's still amazing over there. And obviously used in a lot of sparkling wines and including a lot of the new Blanc de Blancs, which are killing it out there in the marketplace. And they should be because they're really a great example of really well grown Chardonnay. So really what started you guys going in this direction, Dominic? Well, it's not much different than what brought my father to Pritchard Hill. Uh, it was saying, well, look, we've actually made Chardonnay for, for many, many years. Uh, and there was, when we bought this property, yeah, Cabernet, we knew that was gonna be the core. And luckily there were some vines planted here in 1963 and 64. But they, the man who started to develop this property didn't really know what he was doing. He knew he was in Napa Valley and he knew that he thought, well, I should plant grapes. And there was a wide variety of grapes planted on this property that my parents brought. And some of it was Chardonnay. There was Johannesburg Riesling. There was Napa Gamay. There was, you know, Merlot. And you know, it, it was just a smattering. But again, the core was Cabernet. So when, and, of, and then of course we had a big swath of Chenin Blanc. Yeah. You know, uh, the Chenin Blanc is the one white varietal that we stuck with. Uh, and we even, we got rid of all those Thank old you. vines uh, <laughs> at some point because we, we, we nursed them along as long as we could. Uh, but at some point we had to just, you know, accept the fact that they weren't going to live forever. Um, and, and really we had been eyeing those hillside terraces for Cabernet for quite some time. So we still have three and a half acres of Chenin Blanc. We're not going to get rid of it. We love making it. We think it's a, you know, a beautiful expression. Please. Yeah. Um, but the Chardonnay, you know, it was, again, it was there and, you know, we made it for years because it was on the property. But when it came to looking at replanting, that was one of the first ones to go. It was, you know what, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to do this here. This is not where Chardonnay wants to be. Um, and so, but we liked it. We liked making Chardonnay. We wanted to make a better Chardonnay. And we started chasing Chardonnay down, down the valley. And we started going, you know, further and further south. And eventually we sort of made it around the bend and got into Carneros and then we got farther into Sonoma until we realized that the best of the best of what we were getting was was solidly in Sonoma and, right. and that you know that sums it up in a very very quick way but um, luckily during that time we had also had the opportunity to be making some custom crush wines for, for other people, people who didn't have wineries. We had a little right. bit of space at the time uh, in the 80s and, uh, and 90s. Uh, and they were bringing us some Chardonnays and some Pinots and some things that they were getting from Sonoma. Um, and that gave us an opportunity to get to meet some of these growers, the Duttons, the San Giacomos. Uh, now people like Oscar Renteria uh, is over there uh, farming. Uh, he's the one who farms the Calesa vineyard. Yeah. Um, and so with that combination of, of searching for these great vineyards, uh, getting to know these growers who, who were growing the fruit and getting to become friendly with them and understand that they were passionate about we were, what we were passionate about, which was making great wine. Mm -hmm. um, we came to, to feel like, well, gosh, if we're going to continue to make Chardonnay, we need to highlight that from where it's coming from. We need to really just talk about the fact that any great wine has to come from great vineyards where that grape is meant to be. And we feel that that was the case with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And that's why we went with the grower collection. This is about finding people who are growing the, the wines in the right place uh, and, and you know, giving us the opportunity to make what we think are beautiful wines. I absolutely agree. You know, if you think about it, everyone, um, Napa Valley, Cabernet, Sauvignon Blanc, um, Merlot, those are the three main grapes. That don't, don't ever discount Zinfandel though. I mean, cause that's what was there before all the rest of them and Petit Syrah from St. Helena and things like that. But the fact is that really why it works in Sonoma County and Carneros and these different little sub regions of Sonoma County where I'm based and I'm here right here in Petaluma, um, is because of the wind factor. It is 
warm here, not so hot. You know, you go more inland. Remember, there's a there's a big mountain range between us, and that's the the Mayacamas. And then you go past that, and then you go up the Vaca Mountains to get to Chapelet. Now you're on a different plane, and you're looking. You're really looking pretty much west from there or southwest. And there's a lot of these little parcels in back of uh, Dominic in that picture. We'll show you. But the the fact is that this is just naturally cooled here. Um, it comes off the Petaluma Gap and, and uh, I want to give you guys another trivial uh, thing that you can win a big prize and if you do you have to give me some of the share of that if you win a lot of money. I was the one that came up with the Petaluma Gap Appalachian name and I came up with that 21 years ago as that was confirmed recently by Anna Keller because she calls me the godfather of the gap. <laughs> uh, but it was just one of those uh, special things that I got the, the chance to, when I wrote for the Chronicle to really kind of sit down with some of the people that had vineyards that were growing here. And they said, Chris, what do you think we should name this if we, if we did make it into an Appalachian? I said, I think you should name it the Petaluma Gap because it's the wind that goes through the corridor off of uh, Highway 12 that goes into Carneros through Sonoma County and where it really comes out at, where it comes from is right off the Pacific Ocean at the Bodega Head. Here in Petaluma, there's nothing to stop it. There are no big mountains like the Mayacamas. They are rounded hills where a bunch of cows uh, sit there and make uh, produce great milk that we make great cheeses out of and and there's chickens running around that's why we have butter and eggs day parade every year except for this year unfortunately uh, but the fact is that this is just an ideal area for Chardonnay and for Pinot Noir as well and so you're seeing a nice little picture here of this vineyard and this is uh, obviously the uh, Calessa vineyard and this is, um, I think the, probably just as important here is it's not the whole vineyard and you make this very clear on here. This is from five blocks on that vineyard. So they're very specifically picked out. You've got some very interesting clonal variations in there. And yeah. so there's a lot of stuff going on inside this wine, as I can tell you right now, it's delicious. It's, it's one of the things that, uh, that drew us to that vineyard was the, the wide variety of, of clonal selection there. Um, there's a lot of interesting things going on. Um, I've got my notes so I can make sure I don't mess it up, but there's a uh, Entov uh, 548, Robert okay. Young, Dijon 809, Dijon 76, and Epernay, all in this one, uh, you know. Yeah, one. so the Epernay, you guys, is uh, Epernay means a, a champagne clone. Um, the Robert Young is from up in Alexander Valley, a special clone of that. Um, you have the Dijon clones that came over from Dijon, University of Dijon. They did not come through, through UC Davis. Um, well, they did get approved through UC Davis, um, which is where I went to school. Um, but, you know, it's just this diversity of flavors in here, they're stacked on top of each other. And, you know, I'm, I'm really loving this wine. It's a very pretty color. It's very light, um, kind of pale. Um, gold. It's not really very dark gold and it's because it's really, it's not the oak. The oak really isn't really that big of a deal in here. It's really the kind of the boniness and there's a there's a lot of structure to this wine. It's got great acidity. It's got freshness to it, but it's also got that real rocky character to it too that really reminds me a lot more of like if you like Chablis, this is kind of something that might be kind of guiding you there of a California kind of Chablis-like thing. It's because we really push it out here in Petaluma and the wind comes in and you just can't stop the, the fog. It just, it's gonna happen every day, especially, it's really interesting, it obviously isn't happening right now, but it comes and the fact is that every day around 3.30 or four o'clock, the grapes are done ripening. They're just done. They can't go any further because the fog covers um, the, the sun exposure. So I think that what you guys have done and what Philip and, and you as the team have done is preserve this freshness in here. And I really think that this is really a great thing to uh, Oscar Renteria too, of just being a great farmer. And I think that that's what I really appreciate about this part of your program is that you really respect the farmers and you guys are farmers too. So this is a great relationship. Well, we're, uh, we're lucky to have the, you know, we going over to Sonoma and being from Napa and being able to get somebody to trust you as a, as a, you know, as a winemaker, and I can tell you, um, the Duttons asked the San Giacomos when we were looking to, to buy some <laughs> of their fruit, because we had bought some already from San Giacomo, they said, hey, are these guys, should we allow them to buy any of our fruit? 
And, and so Al Steele, who manages the Dutton properties, um, you know, reluctantly said, well, you know, this year we're not going to do a long contract with you, but we'll allow you to buy some fruit. And, uh, but you can't put our name on your label. You can't say where you got it. Yeah. He wanted to make sure. He wanted to make sure we were going to make something worthwhile. And, uh, and hey, I don't blame him. You know, we're, we were ready to, uh, we were willing to, you know, be tested. And uh, so now we can, now we can call out their names. They, they yeah. trust us and, and we're, you know, we're grateful that we, uh, we passed the test. Um, let, me, let me just say this too. We had a really good comment there uh, from Malcolm Jones, great guy. I know Malcolm for a long time. He asked, you know, Chris, what's the difference between, you know, these kinds of Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs from, from Pelham Gap to Russian River? And it's not that far. And you're talking about the two producers that are probably the best known as Dutton and San Giacomo. Dutton being Russian River really founded that area. I mean, he, you know, uh, Mr. Dutton had his big uh, caterpillar <laughs> A tractor and he just bulldozed a bunch of uh, the old trees and started planting grapes and he did a great job and that family is the real deal down in the sonoma area and the petaluma gap area you're really talking about the san giacomos and i want to say happy birthday to Ange san giacomo who turns 90 today uh, happy birthday Ange, you're the man um but also you know i want to say that in russian river if you think about russian river what really changes it up it's the only Pinot Noir zone and legitimately the only Chardonnay zone where you can grow Zinfandel. And you're like, oh, what? Yeah, how, how does that work where you can really do that? You cannot grow Zinfandel here in Petaluma. There's no way. It is just too windy. It's not going to happen. There are microclimates inside of Russian River that are so unique. And I give a lot of, uh, you know, uh, kudos to the uh, the Bacigalupe family. If you guys remember the 1976 Paris tasting, where did uh, you know 90% of that those grapes that were used in the uh, Chateau Montalena wine come from? They came from Sonoma County. They were not from Napa Valley, and that's an important thing. And the Bacigalupe ones were the majority of that. And they are in Russian River. It can get ripe there. Um, there's no doubt. And that uh, there's that uh, road that they're talking about, Sweetwater. Um, that's you know in the danger right now of the burn and everything, but uh, that's a that's an amazing road up there. But you can grow Zinfandel up there, no problem. Here it is really all about the fog, and this is the only appellation. And this was granted as an appellation in 19 or sorry in, in 2017 in December. And the fact is that it really is just influenced by this wind every day, and it is actually the first one ever made based on wind in impressions. So it's a it's a big deal here, and I think that that's why this wine really has it going. And I think that this is a good example. And there's also another question that I do want to come back to about Chris. How would you go out, and how would you really kind of line up? How, what's a night for us out there drinking wine and, and eating food? So we'll get back to that in just a, a few minutes. But let's talk about these wines first. Um, I think that. I mean, what what are you getting out of this, and what why what are you thinking as far as food, Dominic? Well, the, one of my all-time favorite um, Chardonnay pairings came when I was in Louisiana, and uh, I went to uh, Chez Paul, uh, and we were actually just you know coming by to see if they'd like to get some of our wine on the list, and they said, well, you know, we're not going to put any wine on your list in, until we've had it with what we with what we cook. Nice. Like, okay. Sure. And uh, so we brought out the, our Chardonnay and uh, they made a blackened redfish. Ooh. And it was one of those just perfect pairing moments. Uh, and um, so, so I, I, when I, I, when you were talking about, you know, the, the, the wines and the, the food pairings, that was one that, that popped to mind. So uh, I'll take that any day with one of our Chardonnays. Absolutely. You know, what I really get out of this, I mean, we do have the apple characteristic and the pear characteristic here. And there's a little bit of that almost pear frangipane in here, but that's just, um, uh, someone can you give me the clock? Um, sorry. <laughs> um, the, the, the thing about this one too, is it just has that little touches of, of just a nice little nuances of spice, not big and they're not overpowering, but it's got that citrus driven feeling to it. You get a lot more of that in Carneros because Carneros will almost every single time you taste a Carneros wine has some version of a lemon in it. 
lemon. Whereas if you go to um, Russian River, it's not, don't be surprised if it's got some tropical notes in it, which is much more in that kind of a vein, like the mango, where'd that come from? Oh, it must be from Russian River or someplace like that, these kind of warmer zones. I think this is that perfect balance of all of those things. Mm -hmm. And I like it because it does have that acidity that we talked about as being one of those things that you really need to measure about what will this wine pair with. This has great acidity. And that's really something that you can uh, make it really, I mean, the worst to me, the worst Chardonnays are cloying. They're just sweet. They're yeah. cloying. They just, they just don't feel good. I mean, you have to have food with them um, and it just doesn't work. So um, I think that's a, a little bit different, but I think for me, uh, one of the one of the great things that I just saw that was um, uh, just focused on in our um, in our newspaper here at Press Democrat was a really nice peach salad uh, with a little bit of arugula, a little bit of um, some some uh, feta with it, and uh, some kind of a zesty kind of um, uh, seasoning, you know, in in that um, vinaigrette. I think that would be killer with this. I think that would be great. I'd also do. Yeah, I'm just trying to make people ha hungry. I'm sorry. Um, so good. Yeah, but also like scallops. I mean, when you have really good scallops, I've got a great fisher guy that is out of San Francisco. And when he gets me the two pounds, I just go nuts. But, you know, pan seared with a little bit of almost brown butter, but then the lemon would be a really nice compliment here too. But you got to have a side salad. You got to have some things like that. I think those are some really nice ones too. And if you get into like, some of the things um, someone also mentioned with the Chenin Blanc, and thank you for mentioning that, that is one of the greatest pairings for Thanksgiving ever, no doubt. Um, because you have to think about, I think the point there is what else is on the table, you know? And especially when we do these at home meals, especially now, is you might be making a single plate or you might just be doing a pass around and all those factors play into what will pair right with with what you're eating that night so you know how much of this do you have in that bite how much of that sauces and things like that but i think that um, actually butternut squash soup would be very good uh, with this too and as we get into the fall that's something that we would really be thinking about maybe even pumpkin soup um, which is really fun especially if you put a little bit of pumpkin spice in there it's very nice so if if i can switch back to the shannon because you, you popped in there um Sorry, I gotta keep talking about that Shannon. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I uh, love with that Shannon is uh, is curry. Uh, oh God, yes. Beautiful. And whether it's a uh, you know cold curry chicken salad or you know a warm curry dish, uh, either one. Uh, so you can go summer or or fall with that. Uh, it's it manages to be a really beautiful pairing. Yeah, I think going back to that too, just because we're talking about you know, international kinds of foods. I think this would be a really nice touch um, because of that acid with Thai food. This one in particular, this wine, because uh, it's got that freshness and cutting acidity in here. And when you think about papaya uh, salad, right. yeah. yeah. Yeah, when you think about papaya salad and you go to, um, you know, the slanted door and you have that papaya salad, it's an out of body experience. <laughs> Yes, they're going to be pairing it with Riesling and everything, but it's because it has really good acid, but so does this wine. And this is Chardonnay, and you can really taste the character of Chardonnay and the Petaluma Gap in this. And I think it's a great example of something that you can really stretch out and go beyond just, this is not your cookie cutter or Chardonnay at all. It's the exact opposite of it. And it's got so much to give, and it only gets better in the glass too. And that acidity is really showing right now. Great stuff. Great stuff. Now, speaking of Pinot Noir, who out there <laughs> likes Pinot Noir? Yes, yes. Obviously, Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, no doubt, number one varietal over there, red varietal. Sonoma County, don't even doubt that Pinot Noir is the number one grape here. There is no doubt, and it's been found. I mean, this is, uh, you know, years and, and, you know, 50 years of the development of this grape variety, and this is uh, the Fed... Frederick um, Vineyard. Uh, I always want to say Frederick, but it yeah. doesn't have an R at the beginning. It's Frederick. Um, and this is from, you know, one of the San Giacomo properties. And I just said uh, happy birthday to Ange. Him and his brothers 
let's let's go back to 1927 and, and the San Giacomo family. And this is why I think that probably the, one of the best things about these uh, labels is that you actually say grower collection. Grower collection means a lot, especially the great ones in Napa and Sonoma County, any Central Coast, uh, Oregon, everywhere. It's really respect to these people that, that paved the, the road for all of us. And I think the San Giacomo's with um, definitely Sonoma County, really one of those leaders of that charge. Take this uh, to heart. They came over from, uh, from Italy in 1927. Uh, Angie's um, uh, parents did. And to be really honest, the parents didn't want anything to do with grapes. It's really when the parents were getting old in 1967 or the late 60s, when they started developing their first vineyards, that they started to, to really test Chardonnay uh, first. And then Pinot Noir as it came along, they now own 1,600 acres of vineyards that they farm themselves and they're super picky about the people they sell it to i know that is a fact i've been to some of those parties where they have the winemakers and they they taste their wines next to each other and you see someone shaking their head oh, watch out you know it's not good but the fact is it's all about quality and these guys and i, I give it to the next generations with steve and michael and and their sister and Everything about this is so great. And this is really one of those great families that I think is as great as an iconic family of Sonoma County as you get. So this is really that kind of part here where we get into the Pebbleman Gap and, and also this wind tunnel. And why does Pinot Noir work here? You'd think that you'd plant it out here. You can't grow Zinfandel here. You can't grow Cab here. It's never gonna ripen. So you really need to kind of get into this um, a little bit more. And I think that this is really that kind of style that really does a great job um, of giving you the full bodied flavor, but also so much precision there in like where it's from and the clones. So tell us a little bit about how, how this all kind of started with your Pinot Noir program, Dominic. It, it's, you know, they, they went hand in hand. We were making Chardonnay, as I said, right from the beginning. But, um, but the Pinot Noir really did come out of our working with, um, with some people who were making wines at our winery, doing what we call a custom crush. Um, and it gave us you know, an opportunity to, once again, meet these people who were bringing in the, in the grapes. Um, we made, started making a little bit of Pinot Noir for our wine club. Uh, and so you know, it would only go to them. It wasn't going out into the, into the world at all. Uh, and, and we knew immediately where this was coming from. This, this was obviously coming from Sonoma. There was never any doubt. Yeah. Um, but when we went into the grower collection, it was very clear that we now had the opportunity to say, okay, not, not just generally Sonoma, but boy, if we could get these five rows out of this vineyard from San Giacomo, from one of the San Giacomo properties, if we could get you know, a small section out of this little Dutton property, um, these have such unique characteristics. You know, let's, let's enhance them, let's do that. And that's why we make you know, a number of different Pinot Noirs you know, under this label because they deserve it. They deserve to be you know, recognized by their vineyard, by their grower. Yeah, I think that's great. And I mean, your, your participation at the events in the Sonoma Valley events where you've got a little tasting room over there too it's not open right now you guys so don't rush it but when it gets back open you need to go there too to taste this specific you know line of wines there so it's like gives you a reason to go to napa it gives you the reason to come to sonoma but everything about this is really what i love about it is your family working with other families and this is a really big thing. You know, it's keeping that tradition alive. It's not corporate owned, it's family owned. And it's really people that, you know, that vineyard behind you guys, you control your own destiny because you control that vineyard. You, you, you buy, you don't buy grapes. You, from that vineyard, you farm those grapes. And the same thing, these, uh, vin these growers over here are that high of quality that they are on that standard scale with what you do there. And I think that's a great example of why this friendship of Napa and Sonoma, everyone thinks they're totally different. You'd be surprised how much closer than, than you think that they really are. <laughs> because there are certain things that Sonoma County really excels at. And there are certain things that Napa really excels at. And we, because of food, it's been connected. 
And I think that's a really important thing. So tasting this wine, first thing that comes to my mind is salmon. Um, I want it. Um, if you, if anyone's ever been to the International Pinot Noir celebration up in Oregon, which is one of the greatest things ever, and I'm sorry that they couldn't do it this year, but we'll be back. And, um, but the thing that, I mean, ES tasting all these great Burgundy wines and all these uh, California wines and Oregon wines against each other and everything, that's great. But the fact is that when you really go to the, the, the big um, salmon roast, it's the best thing ever because you're tasting these things put on big pieces of wood and they're just like sitting there and these, the size of these fish are crazy, but I think it's really the char marks on there too. Once again, we talked about char and pork. When you're into Pinot Noir, the one thing about Pinot Noir, and I give you guys a lot of credit for this, it's not easy to make. <laughs> Let's just say the worst, hardest ship of, of anything in the wine industry is making Pinot Noir. You can screw up so bad and, and, you just you don't want to and especially when you're laying your brand on the line i think philip and the, the team there are like you know it's not as easy as making cap let's just put it that way um, <laughs> but what you get out of it is so rewarding and i think that because of our palates and i think that i give nothing but the greatest credit to women for the pinot noir um, explosion they did the same thing with merlot and what is the combination of merlot and pinot noir tannins they're not that big. You can eat um, a lot of different foods with these because they're not tannic wines. They're they're more of a finesse kind of wine. The delicacy is there, but they also have a lot of fruit flavors that you can pair up very nicely with these kinds of foods. So getting into this, I mean, this is something like that risotto. It has that little bit of an earth tone to it too. Risotto with wild mushrooms or even, you know, um, chef, you know, um, uh, black trumpet mushrooms in there, Asian cuisine, you know, more delicate styles. I'm, I'm, you're selling me on this um, wine and, and that okay. right, right away. So I'll yeah. tell you, um, I did a pork loin the other night uh, that I grilled, uh, but I did a, a sort of a, a mushroom, I don't know what you would call it, a roulade, and I yep. sliced it and I, and I put it inside there. Uh, very simple, just some shallots and, and mushrooms. Um, and then I glazed it with a plum glaze that I made from our plums on the property. And that was phenomenal. That sounds pretty dreamy. Yeah. yeah. Now yeah another one that, yeah, another one that I'd go like almost Ar Armenian on you is uh, pomegranate chicken. Um, another one that's really interesting, but it has that kind of subtle spiciness to it too. And I think this one can really hold this um, as, as really well on that too. And I think it's just because this is different clones. Once again, if you really want to get nerdy about wine, get into Pinot Noir. I mean, you can get as nerdy as you want. And when we talk about clones, there is nothing bigger than the clonal talk in Pinot Noir. And you talk about, this is an easy lesson. Anything with three digits, it's a Dijon clone. I came through Oregon State University and it's because Willamette Valley up there, I love that place. It's amazing. But they have, they take risk every single year. They have had a lot of heat waves up there and then they just get rain. Um, so you never know what's going to happen and what point it's going to happen. They're also about a month behind us as far as ripening. So they're taking a lot of risk every year. That's why the Dijon clones came into the United States. We had the Martini clone, we had Pomard, which is an old French clone, and all these kinds of things. But now we are really stacking it up to have everything that really excels in different kinds of parcels and different blocks that really is special. So I think that there's really something there to be said about, you know, the San Giacomo's have been doing so great with Chardonnay for so long, but they've really gotten very good at Pinot Noir and it's because they listen and learn. I think all of us are doing the same thing with these clones of Pinot Noir and they're so interesting. There was one that just won the North Coast Wine Competition. It was the Pomard, or it was the 777 clone mm -hmm. uh, by um, uh, uh, Papa Pietro Perry. And the San Giacomo's Chardonnay won the, the competition too. Go figure. So, you know, these are the, the commitment to quality for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay is very strong here in Sonoma County, just like uh, Cabernet and Sauvignon Blanc is in Napa Valley. They're, they're two keys that we don't do the same thing, but they so good, especially when we talk about putting meals together and all these different dishes that we have and where do we go with a four course meal? You know, does that mean 
we have to do everything from Napa Valley or everything from Sonoma County? Not at all. It means we have opportunities to, to really use these wines to really showcase the food and showcase the wine and how well they work together. So, um, Chris, I just, I, I can't answer all the questions that come up and yeah, let's go for some questions. I've been there, but uh, we had one down here from James Watson. He asked if I cater, first of all, um, <laughs> only, if, only if you're at my house, I will cater to you. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're call James. The time. Uh, but he then said he makes a Persian dish, uh, Koresh Fessingen, uh, yeah. with uh, chicken and walnut pomegranate sauce, great with Pinot Noir. So, you know, we're inspiring people to, to, to bring out their, uh, their culinary expertise here. Absolutely, and James Watson is a great guy, so good man, good man. If you can, if you can read off the questions, I can't read them as well because it's on my phone versus your computer. So um, let's answer a few of those questions real quick. All right, let me go to the questions section. Um, Let's see, Kyle Frazier, are the same Dijon clones grown in Willamette and Sonoma? Yes, that is true. And they came in different waves. So it was really uh, 113, 114, 115 that came in the first range uh, for Oregon State University. Um, and I give, I give the, those guys up there so much credit. We could talk about Willamette forever because they, they're just, they were super brave. Most of them went to Stanford, which is crazy. They went up to Ridge and they were drinking a bunch of wine. Thought, oh, let's get in the wine industry, but they couldn't afford any land down here. So they moved up there and took a total risk. They really did a great job. I think I give a lot of credit to those guys, but they are the same clones. The second wave was more the 667, 777, 828. And now you have those on top ones that we talked about just for a moment. Um, and, and that's great. Um, I think that there's some really interesting things. We are really finding suitcase clones too. So that's another whole topic of discussion, but worth talking about. Suitcase clones are those ones where people go over to Burgundy and they're taking pictures of that vineyard, like uh, Domaine Romani Conti or something like this and taking pictures. And they just happen to have a pair of shears right there in their pocket. They just happen to have an empty bag right there next to them. And they go out and start going like this and they kind of put something in there. And this is before 9-11, you guys. <laughs> We can pretty much bring anything back from Europe. It didn't even matter. Um, and then, then once the, the checks at the airports was not good, um, you just didn't do that. Probably the best story ever is, um, it's a weird story too, but it's Pine Ridge and, and uh, uh, our great uh, uh, owner there. They came before he started um, um, Archery Summit or during that time. And he just wore a London fog jacket over there with panels inside that were zippers that he actually cut out the, the parts of the vines and sh shoved them inside his jacket, brought them back. And it, it's called the 828 Faux 828. It's a very strange um, uh, part of Pinot Noir and it's still thought to be more gamay um, that he actually made the wrong decision there. But it actually, the clusters do not drop down. Like every cluster that you see just drops down. Here's the cluster. These point out at you. They are erect clusters. It's very strange stuff. So just so you know, that's the faux 828. So Chris, a um, yes. couple other questions. And, and I know we've run over time, but uh, we'll, we'll try to get to a few of you. Yeah. Uh, this is a very important one from Carlos Orta. Chris, what are some of the great songs to listen to? when drinking Chapelet Cat? Well, let, let, me, let me just say this, okay? So everyone has their food taste. Like my wife, she'll do, she loves chocolate. She loves Thai food. She loves sushi. So I, I gauge things around her. Your musical taste is your musical taste. Down here in my cellar, um, before I became, you know, a small yay and a national wine writer 30 plus years ago when I was at UC Davis, I, I was the music critic at UC Davis and I had my own radio show at UC Davis. And it was, I used to DJ all my high school, um, you know, dances and stuff. So there are, it's everything is based on the mood. Who are you with? What are you, uh, what's the, what's the weather outside? What time of day is it? What are we eating? So that's how I gauge everything. So it's not a simple answer. It's an emotional answer. So you just kind of go with the flow. What feels right at that time is something that's really great. 
for me, if I was to just take a really, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it from my standpoint here. And Rupert, thank you for joining me. Here's my son, Rupert, who will uh, attest to the fact that, um, okay, let's carry on, uh, <laughs> is that um, it's, uh, you know, really something that um, Chardonnay, um, I think about like slow subtleness um, with that. So something that's like a little bit, um, it's kind of a little bit prettier music to start the, you're not going to get jumping around, jump up, jump up, jump down. You're going to just be really kind of like, let's respect this grape. And so really kind of subtle, deeper kinds of tones, maybe a little bit of U2, something like that might work really well uh, with wind blowing in your hair. Um, I feel good about that. You know, with Pinot Noir, definitely sea bearing music, you know, something like that, really a little bit more earthy music because really Pinot Noir, it's better in, in cooler climate conditions. And so something like Coldplay uh, might be good. You know, I like that uh, Coldplay and, and a few of their albums have been amazing. And I, I've actually gotten more into Coldplay more than, than ever. With um, obviously the Estate uh, Cabernet and the Signature, that's a bigger wine and there's just, you got to have a lot of sound in that too, you know, but almost echoing sound. So, you know, something on a kind of more like um, uh, the Cure or something like that might be kind of interesting. You know, like the Forest by the Cure might be a very good song right there. To um, I can see this one inspired you. Yeah, yeah, or, or um, maybe actually with the Chardonnay, I should have said to Rock Lobster by. Um, by the B-52s, of course. One of the greatest college bands of all times, B-52s. Go back and listen to them. They talk about science all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I've got one for me here from John Sloan. Uh, it says, Dominic, I've purchased an allocation of the Pritchard Hill Cab bottles since 2011. What would you suggest a strategy for drinking? Uh, and they just received their 2017 notice that's coming their way. I uh, want to enjoy some along the way and sell her some for future enjoyment. What's the sweet spot? Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a question we get a lot. Uh, I can tell you that we have 50 plus years of history that tell us that our wines age impeccably. So uh, especially when you're talking our, you know, our big caps and, and Chris, you, you've been there. And Absolutely you, agree. Uh, yeah. So so if you are, you know, are looking to, to sell her some, you're going to be, you've picked the right one. Um, but, you know, I love, just like I love to watch a wine progress in the glass, um, I love to try a wine when, when I buy it. I love to know where it's starting. And, and if it's something I get excited about and I think, oh, this is young, but boy, it's got some potential. Then I think, well, I'm glad I bought that six pack or, or, or a case because Maybe I'll try it, I'll set it off to the side, forget about it for a while, try it in a couple of years, try it in a couple of years after that. So if you've got the patience, meter these things out, you know, give yourself an opportunity to watch these progress and take some notes if you're really into it and, and you know, refer back to them. That's really, really fun to do. Um, and, and again, I'll just talk about that 50 year tasting for just a second. Yeah, please Happy do. Having our winemakers uh, from all the way from Joe Cafaro to uh, Tony Soder and Kathy Corison and uh, oh, yeah. Titus all there talking about when they were making these wines, being reminiscing while they were, you know, smelling and tasting these wines about what happened that year, you know, what the struggle was, what the, you know, what they overcame, what, what was special. It was a phenomenal moment. And that's what wine gives us all. When you, when you're, as, as the years go by, wine captures that year, captures that year in a, in a moment, in a bottle, and it'll bring you back there in a heartbeat. So um, it's, it's one of the special things we get to do. Yeah, I, I, would, I would have to agree with that too. I mean, it was a very special moment for me. Um, I, you know, really there's, there's two major tastings that I've been to, or three that I would say. The Chateau Montalena retrospective was really, really amazing. The BV one where we really did taste the 1934 and then the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and then we had lunch. And then we had Andre's favorite Pinots. And then we went into the modern era. It's like mind blower. But you're such a small uh, estate versus them and, and how they branched out. So I think that that really, especially having the winemakers that are such 
amazing winemakers and, and you mentioned Tony Soder. You guys really want to taste some amazing Willamette Valley wines? Follow Tony Soder. I mean, the man is a legend and he did so much for us here in, in Napa Valley and even in Sonoma County and Carneros with the Etude brand. But what he's doing up there is really amazing. Magical sparkling wines too. Do not ever doubt his ability to make sparkling wine. The guy is great. Yeah, but the love fact, it. yeah. Really but, but the fact is that you guys have had such a great winemaking team that it's made it easy for me too as being the person that buys these wines and sells these wines and you know and it writes about these wines um to become you know like so in love and enamored with them because i think that they all are on the same page with with what we really need we need to taste what chapelet is why is chapelet so different from others and I think that they've really been great winemakers that have defined that and helped you guys as a family to really define that. And I think that it's a benefit to me, it's a benefit to everyone out there that's listening to us right now, that these food pairings are fun pairings because we have the ability to, to kind of dial in on what does this style taste like. Every, every vintage of this Cabernet is not gonna taste identical. And that's the great thing because vintage, does make a difference. Absolutely. It does. It's not. A, it's not a household. This is not in every household across the nation. It's not in every supermarket. It's not Costco. It's not in all these places. This is its own identity wine. It's going to have some trademarks. So those berries are always going to be there. That earth is always going to be there. But the vintage is going to define what it is. And I, I think I just saw um, someone write that every ten years is about right where he's feeling it's really good. Um, and I feel like that's a, that's a good point to kind of use as a reference tool for these Cabernets in particular. Now, the big boy here, the hideaway, you can go 20 plus. <laughs> there's no, there's no um, you know, fool around here. This is like a big one that, that really has that. And that's like the wild boar. If you hunt some wild boar, give me a call like we're talking now. Uh, you know, these kinds of heavy stews, maybe even cheese course at the end that's a very heavy kind of cheese you can do that too so you have to think outside the box in many ways but there are things about these trademarks of these specific bottlings that they've done you guys have 50 years of experience and that's so much more than so many wineries can say out there i think that's one of the reasons that we're all tuned into the show right now well you know we've we've been going on and on and and uh, i think we could go on forever you know drinking and talking about food uh, and we've got a, you know, so many questions that we haven't gotten the opportunity to talk about. Um, there's, there's one here that, that I think that you should answer, though. And uh, let's see, I remember, but let's see who, would it, who did it come from. Uh, please give us the correct pronunciation of sommelier. Sommelier. Um, so it's not Somalia, uh, and that's the one that probably gets the most uh, confused is Somalia. Or some, or Somalia. Somal, Somal. <laughs> Think about going to a mall. Somal, yay! I'm going to the mall. Somal, yay! Somalia. So it's kind of the same pronunciation thing that um, happened with, um, I, I think that uh, people had with um, San Giovese very hard at first um, and to be really honest I give Robert Mondavi a lot of credit for that because he called it Fumé Blanc not Sauvignon Blanc um, you know like uh, as far as that goes Sangiovese Sauvignon Blanc these were kind of hard things to do in the old days I think we've become so much more international that these kinds of terms are becoming fine believe me my website it's called Sawyer Psalm and Psalm, if you say Psalm, like the movie Psalm, we know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So even that has been helped along, but Somal, Somal, yay, Somalier. So Somalier, indeed. And I think that I want to say one thing on behalf of Somaliers, you know, um, there are those factors that we talked about. Are you basing this food pairing, are you basing the pairing on the food? Are you basing it on the wine? Are you basing it on your friends? Or are you basing it on the sommeliers that you're dealing with? And to be really honest, if you want that ride and you know those sommeliers that you trust, do it. 
I mean, yeah. it's the funnest thing. I, when I go to restaurants as a sommelier, I can, you know, if, if I don't happen to see the sommelier there, and which I usually do, and we have a lot of fun, and we, we all treat each other with total respect and give each other crazy wines that, you know, we're not on the list and all this stuff. But the fact is, I want to taste the, the chef's special most of the time, because the chef's special is a very important thing to me. Um, and it's because they all know about it. They're all in tune with it. And it makes the sommelier get a little bit more like last minute, like, really? Okay, let me try this. And so you're in their hands, but you are you might have one of the greatest experiences inside your mouth um, that you don't know. And my great experience, how would I describe the great experience with it? I go back to um, uh, the, the show Get Smart. I don't know how many people out there could remember that. Some of you can, but I used to watch it when I was a kid. It was the cone of silence, where the cone of silence is, is beamed over your head. You're not really hearing anyone around you. It's because you're having a moment inside your mouth that makes that much of a difference that you can't hear anyone around you. And that's what a great experience with wine really comes down to. It's really something that invigorates you. You'll never forget it. It's a memory. You're going to share it with people later, late at night by the fireplace in Tahoe or, you know, in, uh, you know, uh, Blackberry uh, Farm in, in Kentucky or Tennessee. And, and you're just going to do it because it really was a, a special moment for you. And those are the kinds of moments that I hope to provide for people. I think that that's the same thing with Dominic and the family of doing their part to do the same thing with the wine, providing us with the wines to do that. And I think that's why the show is super cool. And it's super, you know, like, listen, we, we just need water and food to live. We don't necessarily need wine, but does wine make our lives so much more pleasurable? Yes. It does. Of course it does. And the fact is, it starts conversations that we never thought we would have because we are having those moments uh, with really great wines that open up our abilities to really talk about ourselves. And I feel like this is a real inspirational brand that so many people have learned so many lessons from because it was a very brave brand. And now it is part of our lives. And I think that's why, you know, supporting this and, and supporting you guys out there and making you come thinking outside the, the, the box and thinking about th things that you could do out there to entertain people, to share th sometimes. And like I said, 2020, this is the craziest year we'll ever live, hopefully. But it's more important than ever to share great wines with great friends. And I've been doing that a lot. And then going back to something that you said too earlier, Dominic, was just I've been breaking out a lot of older bottles of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and Cabernet that they're fun. They're just fun. And this is really, you got to appreciate life. And I think that that's one of the things I feel that vibrancy and everything in, in the programs that you have. So I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. It's, uh, we love doing it. Um, it does bring people together. Um, you know, people are usually happy when you show up with a bottle of wine. So yeah, it's a good place. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, um, I know we're really way over our time, but, you know, sorry, we just couldn't help but entertain you guys. And I hope you guys really appreciated this. We're going to be doing another show coming up here on the 17th of September. It's a Thursday night as well. I think it starts a little bit earlier. I think it's 430. Mm -hmm. But we will definitely have that all dialed in. And that one's going to be a little bit more based on the seller. So we did touch on a few points there, but I think we're going to really go a little bit more into the details about that retrospective tasting. We're going to taste some really interesting things. And we're also going to talk about some really fun things, some fun factors about why aged wines are actually very interesting. And I'll just leave it at this. So we talked about like, and I don't want you to show it again, Dominic, because it's just going to make me want to eat the camera again. That big um, tomahawk um, steak that he had looked really good. Is that the right one to do with an aged wine? Not necessarily. Um, it could be too much a power in that, that food that's going to overwhelm a wine that really has a little bit more delicacy now after 15 years of aging inside that bottle. So I think that really that's going to be a very interesting food one as well because we need to really talk about how do you really, if you're going to show off this wine, first of all, don't drink this wine by yourself. And, and I'm, I'm glad that, I, I mean, I, I love that. Yeah. It. I love the thing about sticking the needle in there and taking your little um, siphon out and everything. But what's the point if you're just going to drink it by yourself? Share it with others. 
This is the whole idea about wine sharing. Um, and I think that that's going to be a very interesting focus in the cellaring and building a cellar is also understanding how you pair aged wines with food instead of just pouring them and going, oh my God, this is great, but let's eat a big steak right now. Or, and that could be like that kind of, um, you know, um, beef bourguignon that's a very subtle kinds of flavors and not too overwhelming, but just complements the flavors of an aged wine. So we might even talk about Julia Child, I don't know. But I think it's gonna be fun and it's gonna be a really great adventure when we talk again in September. So, you know, once again, I really appreciate everyone. Mary Olin, I saw that, or I saw you, you just um, uh, sent something in. I'm so glad that you were part of this too. There's some great media people that are watching this right now. And there's great um, followers of uh, Chapelet and just that are inspired uh, by these things that uh, you guys have to say. Um, especially you, Dominic, and and Cyril, and your sisters, and and everyone. The family is it's a great it's a great family. I feel a part of. I always do when I taste your wines. That's very kind of you, and um, you know we we love it when you when you bring people up and, and when we get to share the wines together. Um, I've, I don't know if I'm getting if I'm getting myself into trouble here, but uh, because I feel bad about all these people, the questions that they wanted to ask, I've, I've put my email out there, and I'll try to. To answer your questions, if there's ones that I that I couldn't answer and you just have to know, um, you can email me. And here we go. I'm pushing. It's out there. So now you have yeah. an email. Really uh, easy. Dominic at Chapelet.com. Yeah. So there's like an at between his first name and his last name. Um, really easy. So and uh, SawyerSalm.com, wine at, at SawyerSalm.com. Follow me on, on my website as well and my new show, The Varietal Show. This, is, this was too fun to pass on, just working with Chapelet and these great wines and talking about food. Hey, this is my job. It's it, uh, hashtag Psalm life. This is what I do. I'm so um, happy to be a part of this. I'm, I think I got very lucky by going to UC Davis and especially uh, getting out, you know, in the 90s and, and getting to be a part of this in the 90s and watching these brands continue to develop and, and blossom. And, and I think that really one of the great trademarks of Napa Valley and a family owned brand is Chapelet, no doubt. Thank you so much, Chris. Well, I look forward to the next time. And to all of you who stayed with us uh, throughout, thank you so much. Uh, keep trying new wines, keep, keep trying ours and, and you know, expanding your knowledge and uh, we'd love to see you out here when things change a little bit and we can actually absolutely see person. yeah and, and don't forget if you guys love some of these wines we were talking about you can get them on their website and giving calls to the winery and you know there are some setup uh, opportunities for you to visit not as much as possible right now they do have a great uh, piece of property up there so it, it, you do have an advantage uh, with visiting Chapelet but it's appointment only and and uh, you know, if you're if you're in the Napa Valley area, please um, you know uh, visit these guys. I mean, I'm I'm bringing some friends from Telluride there um, uh, at the beginning of October, and I can't wait uh, to be back up there. It's a really special place, and you really get the heart and soul of these wines when you when you visit the property. There's no doubt. Very kind of you, Chris. Cheers. Cheers. And until next time. Cheers, you guys. Cheerios. Thanks so much for joining us. Ching.